my name is Edward Carson, and I, um, I'm a faculty member at the Brooks School here in North Andover, Massachusetts. I'm a residential historian, and most of my academic work focuses a lot on uh, race and religion. And so and I'm also a member of uh, Communist Party USA, and I chair the Boston Club of CPUSA, so I'm excited to be here. And so I wanted to start off with my presentation really looking at the, the progress and the struggles and the debates within predominantly black church or the African American church. And in this presentation, I, I will go ahead and confess, I will um, link it to some of my most recent research, which primarily focuses on W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, editorial influence on Western Negro migration. Uh, which is my upcoming work, but I'm going to segue in this particular piece here to kind of shape um, a, a, a part of my work and a panel that I'm sitting on at a conference this summer that also looks at the challenges of black identity in the 21st century. So as I move through this, just to make sure we're clear, I'm going to briefly address the obvious, and that is, what is the black church? Um, and, and I will use certain languages such as black, African American, and Negro interchangeably throughout this. Then I'll delve in a little bit into more of the black or the Negro church. Um, and then moving forward, I will conclude by looking at the black church during the civil rights period and offer some thoughts and suggestions as to the challenges of the black church moving forward in the 21st century and how this works, particularly in terms of the struggles within the black church, but also looking at the, uh, the, the progress and the benefits and the things that black folks have to be excited about and proud about, but yet in order to get to that particular conclusion, we've got to go through some struggles here too. So I asked the question as, I, as my work draws on a number of prominent um, black uh, historians and scholars, uh, what is the black church? Before one examines the form and function of the black church during the civil rights movement, and I define the civil rights movement from the period of 1954 to 1965, Brown v. Board of Education to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it is imperative to understand what is meant by black church. Examine the historical development of the black church to be sure to distinguish it from the Negro church, an institution with which the black church is sometimes conflated. So, as historian Eric Lincoln noted in 17, uh, excuse me, 1974, he argued both institutions, both the black church and the Negro church, uh, are important, but there are distinguishing characteristics that deserve recognition and study, in particular as it relates to this discussion here, too. Although the Negro church, as a formal institution, can be traced to the mid-19th century, academic commentary on the Negro church emerged during the late 19th century and early 20th century. And so we got a time factor in terms of the usage of the black church and the Negro church that's here. So I want to start briefly with this notion of the Negro church. The work of scholars such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson thus exemplify this general critique. Du Bois, one might argue, su suffered a little bit from the strange relationship with the Negro church. In an essay, The Problem of Amusement, by the Bois, um, he wrote roughly around 1897, he detailed the dual and often contradictory functions of the Negro church as a locus of spiritual uplift and social amusement. The Bois conceded the fact that the Negro church is not simply an organism of propagation of religion. It is the center of the social, the intellectual, and the religious life of an organized group of individuals. Hence, these are things that pull us all together in one center that really defines us beyond just the spiritual components. And I think this particular point becomes absolutely significant as we manifest and advance closer toward the civil rights movement, which I noted earlier. The boy seemed disturbed, however, by the church's growing identity as an amusement-giving agency. Du Bois fully recognized the social and political potential, potential of the Negro church, but sincerely questioned how such an institution could fulfill its purpose when the people of the social organism demand that he shall take form in the purely spiritual activities of his flock. Time to minister, time to amuse, time to divert, 
we need physical comfort. So the voice is clearly disturbed by this amusement and this level of comfort, sensing that there's something greater for the church than just these elements. He's thinking a bit more revolutionary as the voice is still in some of his early stages and had yet fully moved far to the left and think about some of the individual elements that uh, belong to the Negro plight that we'll, we'll later talk about. Moving on, we get to Carter G. Woodson. Woodson also believed that the Negro church was not living up to its potential. In publishing the history of the Negro church, Woodson diagnosed the church as suffering not only from a generational divide, but a class divide, a regional one, but ultimately from a division over differences in ideas regarding the church's role in the community. So this internal struggle among black folks, and that is, what is the meaning, what is the basis of the church, and what role and function functionality should the um, church serve in the black, African American, or Negro struggle, um, using those words interchangeably. The Negro church, as conceived by Woodson, have become a divisive institution responsible for splitting the black community into conservatives who embrace the old time religion and style and doctrine, and progressives who wanted both religion and education in a more modern style of worship and theology. Despite Woodson's criticism, like the voice, both of these individuals found virtue in the Negro church and promoted the reformation rather than its um, dissolution, hence seeking the good and the value, which will, revel, excuse me, which will later be seen once we get to the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. In 1933, Benjamin E. Mays and Joseph Nicholson published a groundbreaking study of the Negro church entitled The Negro's Church. They too found the Negro church to be the sum of its virtues and vices. They cited poor education of the clergy and teachers and financial mismanagement, which were problematic in the church, and social disengagement as notable shortcomings of the Negro church, henceforth really creating problems for the type of radical advancement and to be this beacon in its place as a savior for black folks moving forward. They were, they were greatly um, troubled by this. The virtues of, um, of the Negro church, however, were attributed to the genius of the Negro church. And so they will later come back and they will rectify and they will really give us a sense of the significance of that particular argument that's there. We get on to someone that we were potentially versed in, we know quite a bit of, and that's E. Franklin Frazier, who built much of his work off of, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, Woodson, as well as Mays and Nicholson's um, in his text. E. Franklin Frazier's work, The Negro Church in America, he noted, one of the most compelling and comprehensive historical studies of the form and function of the black church in America are rated in these things. That is, chronicling its birth through the blending of West African religious structures and beliefs and the formalized elements of Christianity that are going to be a part of this. And so he delves into this idea that black religion, the black church, all of these things are going to be sequenced in the emergence of black identity, and black folks are going to find their spiritual soul in the black church, hence black people are going to use the church to link them back to their days in Africa before forced migration into the realm of the narrative of what we call the American society of the American now USA that's here. In its positive endeavors, this nation within a nation, no, this nation within a nation, help blacks empower themselves economically, educationally, and politically. They were able to build economic institutions and expand educational opportunities and engage in local political arenas. Conversely, what Frazier found stifling, however, about the Negro church and its organization was the authoritarian leadership style that was often found within the church. And as a consequence, Negroes have had little education in democratic processes. So this becomes that, that, that struggle because a lot of this leads to the fact that early on in much of history, black folks lack the, the, ability, the literary ability to grasp complex philosophical religious narratives that were there, and thus only those who mastered the language of biblical understanding held power. And yet, until the church got to a position of being highly democratized, it was going to be difficult for the church to be the savior of a race which we will see again once we get to that period I define as the civil rights movement here. So we get that element of the Negro church that's there. 
we think about the black church. And again, I defined the differences earlier on between the Negro church and the black church. Several years after Frazier published um, his scathing indictment of the Negro church, C. Eric Lincoln wrote, I quote, the Negro church that Frazier wrote about no longer exists. It died an agonizing death. He went on to claim that with the sadness and reluctance and the trepidation and the confidence, the Negro church accepted death in order to be reformed. And it's interesting because James Cone, the author of Black Liberation Theology, noticed that since for something really manifests and to, to grow, much like the resurrection of Christ, it must die then gain, then be um, reborn in different ways here. Ellen Lincoln located the birth of the black church in the mid-20th century, which is important. So now we're talking about the black church being born in the mid-20th century, hence the idea of the civil rights movement. He links the idea that this is the difference from the, ne the black church and the Negro church. And that is the black church is now going to take on a new perspective in being a savior of a race of people who need an institution to fight against the problems and the challenges of white supremacy that were in place. Um, he's going to draw on a lot of prominent people. I, I've got a name drop here, I think, which is absolutely significant. You know, folks like Richard Allen, um, people such as um, um, Henry um, Highland Grant, for example, even dating back to Nat Turner, who was a spiritual man. Uh, and of course, it was God that led Nat Turner to his revolution in Virginia in 1831. And of course, Henry McNeil Turner were inspirational figures in the black church and the rise of the civil rights movement circa 1954. He asserted that, and this is um, Lincoln Fraser here, that when blacks investigated their religious history, they were, reminded, they were reminded that their struggle for political freedom did not begin in the 1950s and the 1960s, but had roots stretching back to the days of slavery. And although we're going to see in the 50s and the 60s the church take on this revolutionary form to save black folks, it wasn't born in the 50s and the 60s. It's been there, and we're kind of creating this renaissance, moving things forward. The socialist progressive stance of Nat Turner, Richard Allen, Henry McNeil Turner, was notwithstanding, Lincoln argued that, quote, the Negro church, out of the church traditionally courted such a conservative image as to have seldom been considered a threat to prevailing social values. And I think that notion holds true today. People look at the church, the black church, and they see black folks in the black church as being very socially conservative-based individuals, but yet revolutions, particularly in emancipating and moving black folks forward, started in the black church in the 1950s and the 1960s. This self-realization, coupled with a renewed sense of purpose and power, fuel the agenda of the church, and in turn shape its identity. Therefore, the phrase, the black church, as used from this point forward, will refer to the collective, largely denominational body of churches comprised primarily of African American people, who through communal worship, race consciousness, and civic engagement, operate as a locus of spiritual empowerment and social agency. Similarly, the phrase, the modern black church, will refer to the contemporary manifestation of the same institution. While both terms are intended to signal a sense of singular institutional form and function, they are not to suggest that the individual black churches that are comprised of the institutionalized black church are monolithic in their theological doctrine. So I'm not saying here, nor are these scholars saying here, that the black church or all black churches are the same. We do know that rural churches operate and function much differently than urban churches. We know that urban churches in areas like Philadelphia or Boston, comprised primarily of Negroes, operate differently than the southern struggles of black churches there. There's just a different narrative and a different history. So we can't make those things alike. Yet, I think the cornerstone, and as other scholars have noted, is the emergence of the notion of my next segment here, which is the black church of the civil rights era. To avoid presenting an, a historical argument, it is important to state that the following discussion of the black church of the civil rights era does not assume that organized opposition to systemic oppression is unique to the black church of the civil rights movement. So this is not a new phenomenon. Historian Anthony Penn writes, the civil rights movement drew on the social gospel to move away from the church's complacency of the early 20th century 
and to reconnect with the social agenda that framed the work of the first generation of independent black churches. Much of the socially progressive rhetoric of the civil rights movement belongs to the early church leaders, but the socio-political methods and scale of implementation were defining characteristics of the civil rights era of the black church. In essence, the point is to note that the scale of civic engagement and the degree to which the church mobilized from the civil rights movement were at the time unprecedented, revolutionary, completely new, different, as Alden Morris noted. The black church functioned as the institutional center of the modern civil rights movement by providing the movement with an organized mass base, a leadership of a clergyman, skilled in the art of managing people and resources, and institutionalizing the financial base, the meeting place, the plan ta tactics, the strategies, and really collectively thinking about the struggles that black folks are wrestling with and how do we overcome our oppression. In the black church in America, Michael Battle, he echoed much of what Moore said about the black church role in the civil rights movement. Battle contended that, quote, the civil rights movement was sparked by the black church and laments that this fact is not celebrated as it should be with more credit given to the black church for momentum of the civil rights movement. The impetus for the black church involvement in the civil rights movement was attributed to the colorblind white social gospel folks who conveniently left out the problem of racism in their campaign to eradicate poverty, violence, and social injustice. And so I say all that to say, we get to a point where there's a debate and an argument about well, what exactly is the black church? And is the black church really something cemented on struggle? And the consensus is absolutely. Without the black church, the progress during the civil rights movement in many ways would have been upended and, 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 and often you could really say shaped in a different way. It offered this liberal notion and this narrative that was inviting to white folks, white colleagues, different comrades to come in and to be revolutionary, to be revolutionized. However, as I conclude, my forecast in some ways is, is somewhat dim too, as my work um, looks primarily at the rise of what I would call the black atheist. That's really grown out of a millennial generation that looks to the black church and they have concluded that the black church today doesn't look like the black church of the 1950s and the 1960s. And thus, the growing sense and in their, in their disdain towards religion is being shaped differently, much more towards the move towards economic resolve and social comfort than revolutionary change. And thus, with that, you have a growing number of what my recent work looks at is the, is the problem of growing black atheists and agnostics who want to um, enjoy the burgeoning privileges that are there. Yet, we're also seeing as a counter-argument that black folks have joined other leftist groups in what I would call progressive liberal movements, such as Black Lives Matter, to be a rescuer and a voice for the oppression and in ways in which the black church has not fully and functionally recognized in this age of the megachurch, or even in the language of uh, prosperity gospel. Yet, in conclusion, we are here, regardless of what we believe and what we see, due to the success of a generation before us, of our predecessors, of going to church, being endangered, worried about the Klan bombing them, and yet situating themselves over a long period of time of mass organizing through social struggles and through this unified embodiment that we as black folks must work to overcome our oppression and our suffering in order to bring about true revolutionary change. And so all of that said, even going back to the criticisms of Woodson and Du Bois, some credit, no, 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 I'm sorry, not some credit, a lot of credit has to be given to the black church as a revolutionary body in a history and a narrative of Negro, spiritual, political, and economic, and even educational struggles, henceforth the reason why Brother Carson right here is speaking to the camera. So thank you so much, and I appreciate um, um, the audience here, and, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions.